Hello, folks, and welcome to today's webinar, Compost Soil Plant, Putting the Many Facets Together with Dr. William F. Brinton. Uh, this is the sixth and final webinar in the on-farm composting and compost use series. I'm Linda Wilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your facilitator for today. Uh, a quick shout out to a couple of ILSR composting fellows who have helped with the series, Sophia Jones, who's provided technical support throughout the series, and Clarissa, Clarissa Libertelli, who created this beautiful graphic. Thank you both. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and to protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. You can find out more about our work and peruse our wealth of resources on our website. If you go to ILSR forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop-down menu on the right-hand side of the screen from which you can find reports, infographics, webinars, podcasts, a policy library, and maps. Uh, we also offer technical training through our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program, and we're excited to announce that we will be releasing a self-paced online Community Composting 101 course later next week, or uh, we'll be releasing it next week. Uh, this course covers composting fundamentals and the ins and outs of starting a community-based composting initiative, so stay, stay tuned for that. Um, this webinar series has been brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region by 2030. You'll hear more about how the Million Acre Challenge is grounding its soil health programming in the latest science in a moment. But first, a recap of the series. Uh, the first three webinars in the on-farm composting and compost use series focused on best management practices for creating high quality compost including setting up a composting system on your farm, integrating composting into your farming operation, and developing composting recipes. Uh, the final three webinars are focused on the broader benefits of using high quality compost, including to the soil, climate, and your farming business. We also covered how to assess compost quality and how different feedstocks can be used to create compost that benefit specific crops. Today, Dr. Brenton will guide us through the role compost plays in enhancing on-farm nutrient cycling for the benefit of soil, plants, and water quality. You can view the recordings for past webinars in the series by going to ilsr.org forward slash on-farm composting webinar series and registering for the individual webinar that you would like to watch. And though this is the last webinar of the on-farm series, uh, we have another great webinar coming up next week that may be of interest. Uh, using and selling compost from community sites is coming up on Tuesday, December 14th at noon Eastern time. It will feature Dr. John Spargo of Penn State's Agricultural Analytical Services Lab and a panel of community-based composters. It will cover how to read a compost lab test and different uses and markets for finished compost. You can register for that on our website as well. So now let's get to know each other with a few interactive polls. First question, where are you participating from? We know you answered these questions when you registered, but just so that we can see who's on the line. Uh, Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or outside of the US? It's always fun to see who participates from outside of the US. All right, just one more second. And let's see who's here. Definitely majority from the Northeastern US, but good showing from the Midwest. And we've got to do more to outreach to the South, uh, Southern and Western US. And thank you to those who are participating from outside of the US. Okay, next question. Are you currently composting? Yes, you're already composting. No, but you're interested in starting. No, but you're interested in supporting others in composting or something other. And if you select other, if you wouldn't mind letting us know in the chat uh, what that means. Other folks might not be able to see that, um, but for us as ILSR, as the hosts, it's interesting to see. Alrighty. <laughs> Let's give you guys just a couple more seconds, but there is a very 
strong majority of folks who are already composting. Wow, I have not seen that number before. Uh, so yeah, excited to give you all some new information about composting. Um, okay. And final question, what best describes your affiliation? Um, farmer, composter, farm service provider, and I know this is a large category, uh, researcher, government, or nonprofit, and other business or other. And I know uh, educators are also a big category out there. Um, so if you're an educator, go ahead and let us know in the chat. All right, just a couple more seconds. Okay, even split between farmer and composter and researcher, government, and nonprofit, which is a very big category, I know, um, and even a few other business or others. So, great. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, yes, so uh, thank you all for joining us from wherever you're joining us. And uh, just a few housekeeping notes now. Um, you, sh you will have noticed that everyone is in listen only mode. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, but please enter them as they come up in your GoToWebinar control panel, um, it should be on your screen. And yes, this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you later this afternoon. Alrighty, so now um, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Garfield from Future Harvest, uh, Chesapeake Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, Lisa leads the Million Acre Challenges Science Work Group and its soil health focused programming. Uh, but before that, she was the owner operator of a diversified vegetable farm on the Delmarva Peninsula of Maryland. She also earned a master's in science in plant and soil science from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So I'm gonna hand over the, oh, no, I've got the controls. You can just unmute yourself, Lisa. There it is, okay. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As she said, I'm Lisa Garfield. I'm the research manager for Future Harvest and for the Millie Nager Challenge, and I lead the science working group. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about the Million Acre Challenge and our approach to working with farmers, researchers, and policymakers to advance soil health and regenerative agriculture on a lofty goal of one million acres of Maryland and Chesapeake region farmland over the next decade. Um, as you can see in this slide, we have um, kind of a holistic approach that includes uh, farmer engagement, soil testing and soil health benchmarking, um, consumer engagement, and uh, farmer making the business case for healthy soils practices, how, how the economics of soil health play into uh, practice adoption. Uh, next slide. So sorry, sorry for being redundant, but this is our, uh, our list of, of partners on the project. Uh, it's a collaborative of these six organizations, including ILSR, who's organized this great composting series. Um, next slide. Uh, so in order to be brief, I'm just going to dive right into um, the framework that we developed to measure progress towards our goal of a million acres uh, in healthy soils. It's the tiers, our tiers of regeneration. Um, and in addition to serving as the way that we can measure progress uh, as a project towards that goal, it also serves as a way that farmers can track their own progress towards moving towards um, a management system approach to adopting practices that take into account their whole farm ecosystem and that we believe can lead to more resilient and profitable uh, farms and can also uh, benefit, you know, provide ecosystem benefits both on and off the farm. So things like water quality, water holding capacity, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, and even carbon sequestration. Um, so the, the backbone of this framework 
is really coming to an understanding of which management practices can reliably lead to healthy soils and which measurements and assessments uh, can serve as indicators that progress is being made. And so uh, with the help of some of our state soil experts, we developed a list of practices and a list of assessments and lab tests that farmers can use to determine the best pathway for improvements on their farm. And we consider that to, that there's many different pathways and um, you know, we, we want to be open to helping farmers make the best decision for their particular production system, uh, for the resources that they have available to them, for, you know, location, topography, all of those things that make every farm unique. Um, so the list of indicators that we kind of winnowed ours down to after looking at research from uh, the USDA and NRCS, Cornell, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Soil Health Institute, lots of great organizations um, looking at these same questions. Um, we kind of winnowed ours down with the goal of being able to create um, a shortened list of tests that are both accessible and available to farmers and that are likely to show change in a reasonable amount of time. So um, that includes things like basic nutrient testing and pH, which are you know, really important uh, for, for crop health and are really necessary. Um, organic matter, active carbon, and aggregate stability. Uh, there's a lot of other, uh, I certainly wouldn't discount the benefits of, of a lot of other tests out there. And I know that Dr. Brinton will talk about um, some great tests today that, that his lab uses. Um, and I think there's a place for all of them. Uh, we just try to be um, conscious of the, considering the why you're testing uh, before determining which test to use. So in this case, really focusing on um, accessible and available tests. So another important piece has been our partnership with PASA Sustainable Agriculture in Pennsylvania to expand their soil health benchmark study into Maryland. And that study has been really illuminating for farmers. We uh, work with them to collect soil samples and detailed management records that help determine the impact of their management practices on soil health and also offer comparisons with farms of the same production system so that uh, farmers who participate have some context about um, where they're doing really well and where there's room for improvements. Um, so there are a lot more details I could go into today, but I'm really just here to give a little teaser of what we're working on and some of the considerations we've made. Uh, but I'd really like to invite all the farmers uh, here today to add your acres to our effort by joining the challenge and learn more by visiting our website. And to uh, other folks on in the meeting today, people from organizations or researchers who are working in soil health issues, uh, we are always interested in partnering uh, on research or programming. And uh, we consider this conversation about soil health practices and how and why to measure different elements of soil health um, is very dynamic and we're interested in continuing to explore that with others. So uh, thank you, Linda, for giving me a few moments and I'll hand over the mic now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. And now uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Will Brinton. Uh, Will Brinton founded Woods Ed Laboratory in 1974 while managing an organic farm and beginning studies in agronomy. At the time, American land-grant universities were not supporting research in organic farming, farming, <laughs> organic farming, so he transferred to an international master's degree program and entered at several organic farming research centers. Upon stateside return, he earned a doctorate degree for his re research on plant response to composts. Uh, Will is the inventor of the Solvita soil and compost tests, and his lab has grown to an international institute with soil sampling across North America, and continu continues to expand soil health testing. Uh, Woods End has recently, uh, was recently awarded a large USDA research and development project to explore the carbon benefits of conservation lands to measurable global climate issues, 
and is part of several soil carbon initiatives presently grappling with the decline of soil carbon in relation to global climate issues. So without further ado, we'll take us away. Uh, you are still muted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was a great introduction and nice to hear something of the background of your group. And, and it reminds me of how widely compost links to so many fields, not just um, science and farming, but social issues as well. In a way, my institute here in Maine, we, we have a, a commercial testing laboratory and a uh, nonprofit institute called the Woods End Institute is patterned after some of the organizations I worked with in Europe that had strong social and scientific um, connections so that all the issues that were developed as it were academically or in the laboratory were also being tested in the field and modeled after sustainable farming practices. So hence the title, compost, soil, plant, and healthy soil. It seems like with each passing year, and I've been in the field over 40 years, we find new dimensions to the topic of composting. And with those new dimensions, we shift our discussion, but it really hasn't changed the basic um, enterprise and the basic aspects of the field itself. Um, today, I'm going to emphasize um, kind of my voyage in the science of composting and practice. Um, I, I manage um, an intense gardening program here um, and use compost a lot. Uh, I have been a manager of organic farms where our sole fertility management program was plants, cover crops, crop rotations, and compost. And I'm a strong proponent of organic practices in which essentially my thesis is you don't need to input any inorganic elements into a farm system. You can rely on compost to provide all the nutrition and micronutrients and the added bonus of soil microbes and the added bonus of carbon itself. So let's get started. I wanted to begin with this big picture, and I it's kind of a riff on the USDA nutrition pyramid. I turned it into the soil nutrition pyramid. Um, this reflects a view that there's certain practices that should be overwhelmingly used, and they form the basis of the pyramid. Those practices should be frequently used or the intermediate layer there's practices that should be used upon need which is the upper middle layer and then there's practices should that should be used least of all and only as modifications and notice what i've done here on the very bottom and the most found the solid foundation of good soil nutrition gardening and farming is crop rotations. And yes, you can do crop rotations right in a garden. It's very easy, I do it all the time. We rarely grow the same crop in the same location every year. And this provides not only a succession of, of nutrients and carryover effects, it reduces pathogens in the soil and can also harness allelopathic effects, which is how plants stimulate each other in a cycle. It always um, accentuates soil building through deposition of plant litter and root effects. Coming up above, um, we have more in a farming sense, uh, green manuring and cover cropping within a farm system is similar to a crop rotation. And my only regret today with all the discussion of cover crops is we, we tend to forget that a cover crop is really a way of doing a crop rotation. And, the foundation of good farming practices is crop rotations on a time basis over years. Going further up, I have compost and manure in a, if you will, in a semi-restricted category. In other words, use less of this and use it correctly. I did put manure right at the same level of compost, 
is because we work with so many farmers that are manure-based systems. Um, many of the organic farming systems that I studied as a researcher in Europe were essentially animal-based systems. And so, yes, there was some composting, but manure was a basic foundation of it and um, is important, but it's important only in the context of the quantitative balance with the rest of the system. And sparingly at top of all the minerals and the nutrients that you might add, and that should be really based on soil testing so that you're adding when you need and you're not adding when you don't need. I want to stress a theme here about healthy soil. Um, I like to say soil can't be healthy by itself. It's a little bit of a misnomer to speak of healthy soil because it's not really alive as an organism in the sense that we commonly mean an organism, but it approaches that in the interactions of all these elements. And the most uh, dynamic illustration of this is this photograph here. And we like to ask people what came first, uh, the earthworm canal or the root? Um, and this is just a wonderful example of a soil fertilizing itself by the earthworms have been carrying organic matter down into the deeper layers of the soil, essentially here to the sea horizon. You can even see some of the worms at this depth. And then the plant roots follow with it. And when the plants die, they leave organic matter behind. And in this way, soils possess intrinsic fertility processes. And I only say this because so many people are into adding minerals and nutrients and soil testing labs stress just fertilizing for yield. And we tend to overlook the powerful abilities of soil to build itself and, and to manage its processes. So that my theory is, as, it, as in a, almost a medical theory or an environmental interaction theory, do as little harm in interacting with your soils. So composting. Um, composting in the years that I've worked with it across the country and in Europe, it really has a very unique role in pre-balancing ingredients and nutrients before they would ever be used. And a good example is this picture right here. Uh, we have raw manure in the bottom left of the picture, and we have fruitcake pumice from a winery. This is a picture um, in the Anderson Valley in California, where I worked for years, um, helping integrate composting into uh, organic vineyard operations. But none of these two ingredients here, any of the farmers really wanted to use by itself. The fruitcake pumice is extremely acidic, uh, often pH 4. Um, it's very hard to know how to use it and balance it in the soil. And the manure, in contrast, is high in ammonia, very high pH, alkaline, um, somewhat odorous. But when you combine them together, and we did one-to-one -one mixes all the time of these ingredients, it's literally just the two ingredients, you ended up with a fine and stable product that had an excellent nutrient analysis, which I show at the bottom. And once we really developed this program, we could easily see that um, we didn't really need to import additional nutrients. Another example of composting being absolutely essential for transforming difficult ingredients is, is leaf and yard waste combined with food waste composting, which is continuing to grow. And, an industry in which um, I've had many, many years of experience. Once again, food scraps by themselves can be um, very acidic, have a low pH, and certainly are very odorous. Um, a lot of my early work was focused on doing um, organic acid or fermentation acid profiles of organic waste materials. And these came to be called either volatile organic acids or VOA, or volatile fatty acids, if you will. But this is this is a food scrap sample where we run it through our instruments here and find formic acid, lactic, acetic, succinic, propionic, isobutyric, butyric, isovaleric, and valeric all together. And the combination of these acids is a typical and characteristic stink of rotting food. And if it 
goes more anaerobic, what happens is the butyric acids here start propelling themselves forward and you get that uh, rotten butter smell or even rotten egg smell, which brings in the sulfides. So we need to compost to uh, degrade these ingredients and combine them. And landscape waste happens to be an excellent bulking agent for this. So if you run your process long enough, you balance it out. I will say as an add-on here, there's increasing concern about microplastic fragments. I worked in this field very early in the 90s to develop methodology because a lot of these operations were bringing mixed waste from communities. And although what we're looking at here is cardboard mostly, there's tremendous concern um, about plastics and ultimately microplastics. And this is a field you should all um, be following. So, wow, what a balancing act it is when we start diving down into what's in it and what are the quantities of ingredients. And it's a little bit more difficult, if you will, than chemical farming. In chemical farming, I can order up a fertilizer blend that has whatever in it I, um, I would like to have, or the soil lab says I should have. A lot of fertilizer um, industries will mix and match um, what you need. And it gives you the sense that you're controlling everything, right? And, and it looks good, but composting presents you with a blend of everything in a ratio and a rela relationship that you have not predetermined. And I just wanted to emphasize here the extraordinary mixture and weights in terms of mass of materials coming in um, at 10, 20, and 50 tons an acre. Now we make some assumptions here to arrive at these numbers. Um, I think I average 300 non-biosolid compost to come up with NK, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon content. And this is the um, pounds per acre at these different rates. Um, so it's extraordinary how, if you add up your total nutrients, um, you're putting 500 to 1,000 pounds an acre of total nutrients at a, at a 20 ton per acre rate, and up to 2,500 pounds an acre of total nutrients at a 50 ton rate. And it always concerns me when I hear literature, and it used to be traditional to call compost only a soil amendment. Uh, there was almost a taboo in America in the 70s and 80s. We weren't really allowed to say it was a nutrient source. It, it didn't fit right with AFCO and, and standardization of chemical fertilizer analysis. <laughs> but look at the numbers. It's a massive content of nutrients in the material. And phosphorus alone on a PTO5 equivalent at these rates is quite substantial. Um, and I don't know many organic growers that don't use less than 20 tons an acre. So we're putting quite a charge of nutrients into our soil when we're using it, and we can't control the individual ingredients. One thing I also want to point out is how relatively small the microbial mass is in compost. And again, this is just an average. It's very hard to do actual massive microbes. You can do counts of them but counts don't necessarily relate to mass for the reason of the uh, minute size of microorganisms in the, in the wide range of their bodily mass versus their count. But we have made some effort to do that. And even at a 20 ton per acre rate, you might only be applying 50 to 200 pounds an acre of living organisms. So keep that in mind, it's, it's not a large number, but, but there it is. Um, I also wanted to note here in the carbon discussion, it's not until you get to 50 tons an acre that we get to a threshold, this is 8,800 pounds of carbon per acre, that would meet the four per mil uh, Paris Accord suggestion for 0.04% gain per year of carbon. And that's just an interesting feature to note. So what's the mass of all this in soil itself? And I've worked on this very carefully and pulled some good literature from OSU and WSU on, on this attempt to quantify the mass, both here on the left, of organisms in soil per acre versus available minerals per acre. And so it's very possible to have as much as 
2.6 tons per acre of living organisms. So remember I said before we might be applying 100 to 200 pounds of living microbes, we're applying them into a domain of, of um, two tons or more, 4,000 or more pounds of organisms per, per acre. And it's just interesting to me when we do the ionic um, distribution in soils um, and convert it to mass that soils have about the same amount of available nutrients that they do living organisms. And that is very significant. It's very interesting. So what can we expect from compost? And one thing I want to point out here is organic matter and compost degrade slowly. And this is after you put it in the soil, it continues this long-term decline, up me easily measurable over, over five years. Um, only a small part of the nitrogen is available to crops in the first year. 25% um, is generous. Um, I've measured five to 9% in our field studies. Most of the available um, potassium, most of the potassium is available right away. It doesn't seem to attach to anything um, and it's readily available. Phosphorus is so interesting in organic materials and compost because it's partly protected in organic structures and, and also susceptible to enzymatic release, which makes it particularly interesting. And we also find it's not susceptible to fixation in the soil the way it is if you apply superphosphate to soil it can get fixated immediately by iron or aluminum within a matter of weeks. And it's, it's a grossly inefficient way to put phosphorus in the soil as, a, as an inorganic extract. But when we do it with compost, it behaves differently. Um, it, it actually has less of a harmful effect and it doesn't move as rapidly through the soil profile. And the other thing, I want to stress about microbial biomass. Some people think we're inoculating soil with microbes when we use it, but actually, probably not. Um, we think they're likely to perish and they will become food or they will be eaten by the well-adapted indigenous soil populations. And that's a good thing. So let's talk a little bit about compost behavior. I'm going to break it down into several different groups and one is beginning with um, best use classification for plants with a major emphasis on the maturity and salinity of compost and how to use them. Um, this is a project here in Ohio that I worked on for several years uh, under Dr. Krause. And these are some greenhouse managers who are trying out compost as a mix in their commercial operations. And they're very skeptical and they like to dump the plants out and say, is this normal? Is this good? And so on. Um, some of the big issues of making growing media out of compost, and this is a study I did with Bill Seekins here in Maine um, back in the early 90s, is discerning um, stability, maturity, salinity, and carbon nitrogen ratio effects for good design. So we we were making compost at the time with fish waste. And when we grew plants in it, we really didn't have very good performance. And a, a, a scientist will say, okay, um, I can identify the various mechanisms of that. And we did so. Uh, we also did studies growing the same plants in commercial media. But we also went out and worked, looked to find compost that was really highly um, stabilized and mature. And we were able to demonstrate that with these composts, you could outperform commercial chemical-based media. And um, this brought a lot of interest with the peat industry here in the Northeast in those years and, and led to some productive developments. Here's a study we did more recently in which we identify salinity effects going from 16% compost all the way up to 100%. So it goes down here and up here. These are three packs of plants. The best performance of the, the tomatoes here was at the lowest rate of compost. And the worst performance where we actually had plant damage began after 80% to 100%. So these are features compost has to be identified for the ideal relationship to the media and the type of plant. 
So a study I did with a client in Pennsylvania over years, we found there was a specific maturity threshold between 13 weeks composting and 18, where literally the plant performance changed this much with the same ratio of compost. So there are factors in compost that prevent it from performing well, and if you're going to start using it too early, you will pay a price for it. But it's different for each kind of operation. In this particular operation, we did a research project for leaf and yard waste compost. And we found consistently the higher the application rate, the lower the yields. And it was purely a salinity effect in this case. It wasn't the maturity, but it was the salt buildup. And these are compost with very high levels of grass clippings in it. So the grass has such a charge of nutrients and it goes into salt very quickly. And that ends up affecting your compost. So once again, you have to find the right level. I want to touch on environmental aspects of compost um, in terms of um, interaction with the environment. And this is an interesting um, dilemma that I'd like to describe. This, this goes way back to the early 90s with the construction of Biosphere 2, which many of you know um, uh, lasted for, it's, it's still going as a demonstration facility, but initially, it was going to be um, individuals uh, sealed inside these large greenhouses as though it was on Mars, for example, and living in a sustained environment. But what happened was immediately after they built all the soils, which were a high level of compost in the media and sealed the, the, um, the uh, individuals in the greenhouses, the oxygen levels started dropping. And this has all been investigated and published. So um, essentially, what they discovered was the compost instability and the high respiration rate spoiled the whole experiment. Um, compost required so much O2 to continue to degrade um, at one meter deep in these greenhouses that they had to start supplementing air here when it got too low in order to keep the the um, individuals inside being able to breathe. Eventually it became impossible and, and the operation was scuttled. So compost is that active that it can draw the oxygen out of the air and create a, a, a problem. So I started measuring this in soil. And when we do that, we put compost in soil and we take extracts of air coming off of the soil to see how much CO2 is really there. And it's enormous. You know, at the peak of the warmth in the day, we were measuring 3,500 parts per million of CO2, only a couple inches off the ground. Um, of course, scientists know you have to design these chambers for air flux and so on, and it will dissipate. But it shows you that as you enrich soil, you're going to push up this respiration rate quite a bit. So let's talk about it more at the field scale, compost behavior and soil impact. And I like to break that down into nutrients, metabolism, and physical effects. So back to my theory of, or my principle of do no harm with soils. Um, we need to work with soils in a way that enables plants to explore the horizon and doesn't disenable them. And a lot of modern farming practices have made this very um, difficult because of the severe um, compaction being induced by lots of heavy equipment passes on fields, surface spreading of nutrients, and surface spreading of nutrients has only increased with no-till practices and not decreased. So we have buildup of nutrients in the top three or four inches, and you get this accumulation of roots right in these, these topsoil layers. But the kind of farming that I studied was trying to encourage plants to develop a good rooting system. Um, it's now known that a single plant can explore up to 200 cubic feet of soil per plant. And for those of us who do soil testing, it's quite a challenge because we're only testing about 10 cubic feet of soil per plant, whereas the roots potentially are exploring and drawing nutrients from 20 times that. So it's 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 something just to keep in mind when we start using fertilizers and compost 
we want to encourage this kind of harmonious distribution of roots in the soil. And again, this is going to depend on your soil type and your soil profile. But compost behaves differently, I find, from all other fertilizers. One of the studies I got in uh, was at the Swedish in Institute when I was a grad student. They were um, completing a, a, a approximately a 20-year study on the impacts of compost versus manure versus chemical fertilizer and long-term crop rotation systems. And these are some pictures from the Institute. I'm just going to show one summary that demonstrates the extraordinary quality of compost to differentiate itself from all other kinds of fertilizer. And th these were the final results of measuring the respiration in soil uh, by two different methods. Uh, one day respiration, yes, we were doing that all the way back in the 70s. Uh, it was very common to do 24 hour CO2 assays. More common, we did seven day respiration. That's called basal respiration. And then we found it had an extraordinary connection to earthworms. And over the, the 17 years of the study, the plots that had chemical fertilizer were worse than the controls in all cases, you can see. The plots that had raw manure were better in all cases. Um, these, these here, and the plots with compost had moved up and away from all the others. So there are any number of ways of explaining this, that, but, but one really good way is that it's not presenting the soil with an enormous challenge for digestion, a saltiness from the fertilizer content, ammonia content and manure, a number of desirable features that bring the, the earthworms in and raise the respiration. Um, another germinal study um, that I was involved with in Switzerland um, became a very, very important um, foundation stone for further work on soil quality related to composting. These were studies on the nitrate content of leafy vegetables in relation to fertilizer applications. And we found that even at very heavy rates of compost, whether manure compost or plant compost, we're talking uh, units of nitrogen up to 300 kilograms per hectare, are approximately the same in pounds per acre, we could increase plant yield. This is spinach yield here, but the nitrate levels, which are in the yellow dotted lines, were went up slightly, but leveled off. When you put the same amount of nutrients on as chemical fertilizer, as inorganic nitrogen, the yield did continue to increase slightly, but not significantly over the organic practices, but the nitrate just went through the ceiling. So we had nitrate levels going from 500 to 2,500 to 3,500 parts per million in the tissue of the plants, which shows compost is delivering yield, but with quality, whereas for inorganic fertilizer can't do that. It, it, it's almost like the plant can't control it, whereas the compost has unified it with the soil and the microorganisms delivering it to the plants. Recently with the University of Maine, I worked on some studies on the carbon effect of compost. And this is now beginning to be one of the hottest topics. And we wanted to find out when you put compost on, here's your our tonnage per acre, what is the carbon rate and what's happening to it in the soil? And, and this is part of an ongoing effort to e evaluate um, soil, not just soil health, but carbon sequestration potential. So we measured respiration every week through the whole season in all the pots in triplicate with the four different rates of compost. And we were able to, by summing the area on the curve, we actually were able using one day respiration to simulate the total amount of CO2 carbon leaving the soil and, and take it as a percent of the app applied carbon. And it's, it's amazing, you can see how many, um, it, a fairly large, I mean, 5,000 pounds an acre here of CO2 leaving the soil at these high compost rates. So there's a lot of activity. And we, when, we, when we summarized it, we actually had a linear effect of the amount of carbon added to soil and the amount respired. So that you could 
say, here's 10,000 pounds of, or kilograms of carbon out of the soil and uh, 4,400 pounds of it or kilograms of it went back off to the air as CO2. But this is the, the inverse of this is your carbon sequestration. So we found the compost um, soil was metabolizing 25% of compost, um, converting it back to CO2, um, which is a good thing, meaning the remainder of the carbon is now more stable in the soil. Um, the other thing we noted comparing nutrient levels is that when we went over 50 tons an acre, uh, we were supplying way too many nutrients compared to what, what we had in the soil. So is all this measurable? at the farm level, at scale. And this was a study I did in Mary Meeting Bay, um, measuring uh, an organic farm that only used compost and some supplemental organic nutrients. And we measured in one season prior to compost and post compost applications for respiration rate changes in the soil. And this is the summation here of all fields very highly significant impact on increased microbial rates in the soil. Now that does several things, but look what it mostly did. We had increased nitrate, nitrate release across the farm in relation to the respiration rate. Hence the reason that so many of us are trying to correlate soil respiration with um, nitrogen qualities. Um, Three plots kept falling right outside the normal graph, and we went in to identify what's going on. These had concentrated organic pelletized fertilizer, and it pushed it way up out of the range. So you can see when you when you go away from the compost, you're you're going into materials that don't behave. Um, they behave more like chemical fertilizer than they do as a natural material. But we were growing the plant yield just based on increasing soil respiration from compost. <clears throat> so I want to kind of draw here um, a picture of the um, overall perspective that I presented today um, with compost. Again, I have a strong background in application and use of it. Um, I believe in dynamic farming systems where we essentially replace all inorganic nutrients. I've long believed it could become part of an environmental regulation, but the opposition to this from, from big industry is so strong. And while we've had some buy-in on this by the academic uh, groups in the country, both private and land-grant universities, there's been significantly less R&D put into this field. Um, I measured the difference recently between my colleagues in Europe and here. Um, Europe is providing 10 times more funding for this kind of uh, sustainability development and integration of compost into organic farming than is the United States. And here we continue to emphasize nutrients and even the soil health discussion is strongly oriented around um, inorganic nutrient-based farming with supplementation from cover crops. Whereas if we could integrate it more with carbon and compost, and we know we could easily make a billion tons of, of organic manure-based compost in this country, um, think what we would be doing with our soils. So kind of one, one of my big points is Compost used along with good soil and planting practices has been shown to stimulate soil biology unquestionably. It provides a residual effect. The carryover effect of compost is remarkable. With, with fertilizers, the carryover effect is usually negative. You find it in the groundwater, it's in the drinking water, it's in the bay. With compost, the carryover effect is better and not worse. So again, it's it's almost the opposite of, of this whole inorganic industry that's become so powerful and strong, particularly in the United States. It, it has a long-term beneficial effect, and one of those is carbon accumulation. Now, in all the early research we did, none of us focused on carbon at the time. It was on, yes, soil organic matter, it was on humus, but it's the same thing, it's the same topic by another name. We call it carbon today. 
And the other significant thing, and, and we're in a time where just massive new nutrient leakage issues in this country. I've sat in on some NAS webinars um, in the last year where we're looking at the nitrate problem in America. We now have the whole Midwest with people being exposed to high nitrate groundwater continually. And it's from this inorganic farming industry overusing fertilizers with large support from soil testing labs that are over recommending fertilizers. And none of them seem to have a clue about what an organic nutrient cycle would be. And this is something that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be retired before anybody really gets serious about it. And it's really uh, so interesting. If, if this kind of farming could have been implemented earlier, we wouldn't have these kinds of nitrate and phosphate issues that we do today. And we know the organic materials are available because we're producing them every day. We have the food scraps, we have a billion tons of manure being produced, and it's even hard to find out what's happening to all the manure. A lot of it is just in huge mountains uh, and not being properly distributed to farms or composted. But here's the picture. Compost provides a naturally controlled slow release form of nitrogen and phosphorus and it, it's much superior in its behavior to chemical nutrients it's not you shouldn't even call it a nutrient because it interacts with plants and microbes almost in a way that nature intended it to be um, rather than us launching inorganic fertilizers and now what are we trying to do we're trying to make inorganic chemical fertilizers slow release i mean I did a project recently where we're helping people coat fertilizer to make it less available. And I said, you realize you're just copying compost. You're just copying something nature already did, but they're doing it to try to save the fertilizer industry because the damage now is so large that um, if you put a price tag, for example, on the algae blooms in Ohio, the damage in the last five years is $850 million. And, and that's been measured, studied, and documented. And, and I'm not blaming it all on the fertilizer industry, but it's largely a result of excessive use of soluble nutrients. So imagine a farming system that could co correct this in the simple way that I am proposing. Finally, an interesting thing about compost is that we've decided the carbon accumulation from it is essentially the same as crop residues over time. And that's a good thing. It's disappointing in the sense that you have to put on a massive amount of compost to get the similar benefit of a much smaller amount of plant residues. And that's why plants are kings when it comes to carbon um, contributions to soil in, com in comparison to compost. And, and finally, and obviously um, compost solves many, many problems at once. And, and I could give this slideshow again and emphasize different aspects of it, and I would not have exhausted the topic. And um, I think what's happening in the tremendous challenge today is uh, with, with carbon sequestration emerging, um, it's, it's a little bit too narrowly focused. Uh, it needs to broaden its perspective and look at where is the carbon coming from? Uh, and how are you putting it into the soil? And is the way you're putting it into soil really benefiting the plants in a sustainable way? It's not really about accumulating carbon in the soil. It's about recycling it through nature and through soil. So I wanted to um, end by just saying a little bit about Woods End and um, what we can do to help you. Um, they did say in the introduction they would talk about um, testing and test methods. And um, I would rather leave that to those who are interested in pursuing it. Um, we have developed uh, soil and compost quality tests. Um, I introduced soil health testing to this country around 1979 after the big study in Germany where they came up with the idea of combining physical, chemical, and biological parameters to assess alternative farming. It's, not something that was invented in America. It took us 30, 40 years later to grasp the significance of this new approach, which came 
into the world uh, due to organic farming challenging the conventional agronomic um, uh, paradigm that was ruling at the time. Soil health came out of that whole investigation. And fortunately, it is blossoming in this country. And we have contributed to that discussion in, in the way of being a small independent organization. So the ways that we can help and continue to help is compost quality analysis. Um, we have a really great best use um, system where we can determine the best use for compost for good quality marketing. Um, it's not true that all compost is good for all things, and it depends what the source ingredients are. It depends on how long it's been composted, and I've shown you um, some of the features that you can control, like the maturity is definitely something you can control. You can't control the nutrient content. You can't control the salinity within limits. So these are things that you need to work with a good compost laboratory on to understand how to handle it. Um, obviously, compost integrates with soil health objectives very neatly. Um, no, you can't use compost to make soil healthy. It helps build soil functions that lead to healthy soil. But, um, it, and it's not even the microbes in the compost because we've shown generally they perish in soil but they're being picked up and passed through other microbial successions that are already present in soil. So let's think of compost more as fostering soil health and helping to do it. It's not a caveat um, uh, or a replacement for it. Um, and more recently, we're developing new and more modern carbon tracking models for uh, compost carbon, as well as other forms of carbon introduced into the system. And um, this is leading to new analytical discoveries and um, more recently to developing some models for as we change soil density, for example, as we change soil structure through good practices, we're volumizing the soil. And when you volumize the soil, meaning make it more fluffy, Every time you measure it in the common conventional soil testing lab approach of sticking your probe in six inches, you're actually measuring less and less material. And what's the sad result of that? They recommend more nutrients. So we've got a real dilemma of reductionistic science, trying to tackle the carbon issue, trying to deal with um, unsustainable farming practices, nutrient leakage and contamination of food with excessive nitrates as examples. And compost helps us um, bring this all into perspective. And, and I see a long and um, excellent future for it in this country. So I am going to leave off now and open it back up to um, however the uh, program managers would like to do in terms of questions and discussion. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, go ahead and take over uh, sharing in a second. But um, thank you for leaving so much time for questions. I think this is an amazing opportunity to get to ask you questions. Um, so we've been collecting folks' questions as they've been coming up. Um, and one of the questions that I wanted to start with, uh, can you inoculate your working compost pile with finished compost or something that's been in the compost pile previously? It is a common practice to reuse some old compost <clears throat> in fresh compost. Um, amazingly, 40, 50 years into the work and the science of it, we still don't know the answer to it though. And it goes to my point about so, so little money in this country is being devoted to these interesting horizons of research related to organic material management. Um, I did a lot of work earlier with uh, Dr. Mary Drofner when she was in our laboratory here for a decade, and we did inoculation studies. And most of the time when we inoculated young compost, we couldn't find the inoculated organisms um, later. Um, and what it meant was they may have done some work in there, but they perished very quickly. Um, for example, 
Organisms that live in late mature compost are different than organisms that are active and very young in fresh compost. So it could be if you inoculate with ripe compost, you're actually consigning your your microbes to a, a very harsh and cruel death because they won't be able to survive in the early compost, and they're going to be outcompeted um, by indigenous organisms. But we did find inoculating food scrap compost was always highly successful. And so I think one of the reasons for that was is food waste is very one-sided from a microbial substrata point of view. I mean, think of how much of it has been previously cooked and has, has had the microbes virtually sterilized out of it, though nothing is really ever sterile, combined with high salt content in it, which gives a distorted environment for microbial development um, and the fact that the pH in fermentation goes so low that almost no organisms can survive in it. A lot of food scrap is almost silage. And, and because of this unusual environment, you can inoculate and really have good, good effects. Um, in contrast, I've never had success inoculating manure. Um, that's like carrying coals to Newcastle. I mean, it's the, 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 the supply of nutrient uh, microbes in manure or most green waste is so high, if you count it, that it's impossible to imagine um, inoculating, as I showed at the beginning, like 50 pounds of organisms into 5,000 pounds of existing. So I'm trying to be open about inoculation having a role. Um, we know inoculation in farming is highly successful, like in, in making silage. Um, we make cheese by inoculation. We make wine by inoculation. A lot of uh, food compounds are successful inoculation. So why should compost be any different? And I think the reason is it's an uncontrolled environment. That was a super interesting answer. Um, thank you for that. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to just clarify from when you were talking about using different percentages of uh, or different levels of compost in growing media, the percentages you were including were by volume, so 10% of volume, compost. By volume. That's correct. And right. um, you have to decide how you're blending your ingredients, obviously. When we cut compost into peat moss, a volume to volume ratio is almost a, a one to one ratio on a weight basis because the peat moss has low density and the compost has low density. Although peat moss is usually half the density of compost, it's not like mixing compost in soil. Soil has 10 times higher bulk density than compost does. So if you mix it on a volume basis, it's still overwhelmingly soil and not compost. So, um, this is a complicated field if you're making professional growing media um, or soil-based growing media, which is increasingly my preference, because the salinity of the compost has to be calculated as a dilution of, of the masses and not the volume. So it's the actual dry weight mix that will determine your final salinity. And these are just some of the fun details that we as a laboratory like to work with our clients on so that they get it, all the numbers right. Right, and exactly why it's uh, worthwhile working with uh, folks who specialize in this field. Um, that you mentioned something else about the, there being a big difference between 13 to 18 days, you know, somewhere in, in that range of mature compost. What exactly does that mean, 13 to 18 days mature? Uh, weeks. Uh, weeks. Yeah, much longer period of time. So uh, 18 weeks of compost is not a long period of time for composting. Um, it's not possible to make compost in three days, however, but it, it is possible to get compost extremely hot in as short as three days in, in a more industrial setting um, and to cause an enormous amount of loss. Uh, we did a a replicated study for a, um, a fertilizer company recently that's getting into composting, and they wanted to know how fast is the carbon leaving it. 
And we found in the first 10 days, we had 50% of the carbon loss as CO2, which means the organisms have eaten that much of it that quickly. And then it just uh, tailed off. So between 13 weeks and 18 weeks, the compost gets, um, you can almost say it tames itself down. There's suddenly the ammonia disappears, for example, and gets converted to nitrate. That's a huge transformation. It's like a, a magic moment of when ammonia starts disappearing, you say, now we got it, because that means the soil organisms, the, the um, nitrous ammonis and nitrobacter organisms with, that can't stand to live around too much ammonia and any amount of heating, they're finally able to grow in the compost and get rid of the high level of ammonia. That drops the pH of the compost and gets it ready for plants. So um, it could be any time between 10 weeks and 26 weeks easily. I mean, most compost is at least, I would say, 100 days necessary process. Um, and if you're a home composter, let it go a whole season and the winter in between, it's only going to be better than, than you know, doing it too short. Great, thank you for that clarification. So the 13 to 18 weeks or whatever, 10 to 26, that's from the beginning of the composting process to when it's being used in the potting or in the- That's, that's, that's correct. And, um, <clears throat> Great. Okay, so um, there were some questions about when you were talking about the uh, respir uh, carbon dioxide respired, the respiration rates um, as you increase compost application rates. Um, could you expand a little bit more about that? And does that mean that it can be claimed that adding compost to soil contributes to climate change? Can you just clarify? Yeah, it's a great it's a great discussion because it looks almost alarming how much CO2 comes out of compost. Um, if you put immature compost in a storage building, um, the amount of CO2 that will come out of it will make that um, uninhabitable within a matter of days. Um, it's that active. But the CO2 that's coming out of it is biogenic carbon. It's no different than roots respiring at nighttime. It's no different than litter decaying on the surface of the soil. It's all natural respiration. Um, now, if we burned it as we burn our trash, um, even if we burn natural trash, um, you're forcing the carbon out faster. It's still biogenic carbon. It would have turned into CO2 at some point later. Um, fortunately, if you interact it with, with, the, with composting for soil, a lot of the carbon seems to be captured in the soil. A um, hundred years into this, scientists still don't understand what form the carbon takes in soil. And it's because we, we ignored it and we ignored it and we ignored it until finally you know, we're waking up that carbon is important. Um, so we don't know the form that it's protected in soil. Um, so we're unable to calculate a carbon sequestration based on compost at all, really. Um, but uh, you can be assured that the CO2 coming off of compost is not contributing to climate change because nature has been there from the very beginning decaying rotting and releasing its co2 right so it's basically just making use of a natural process for the purposes of growing food and uh, improving our soil yeah uh, there's some, there would be some caveat to that with regard to methane production um a lot of us were surprised when uh, I would say in the late 90s, particularly in Europe, life cycle analysis of composting began to reveal when the scientists got involved, we were measuring methane being produced during the composting process. So there is a methane footprint to compost because it's difficult to get the right amount of oxygen in it throughout the whole process. 
and um, that is that is a subject. Uh, it's nowhere near as damaging as the nitrous oxide emissions from chemical nitrogen fertilizer that are so much worse than even methane and significantly worse than carbon dioxide. So, um, you know, there has to be a balancing here in where we focus our attention on that. But I thought I should just mention that. That's no, appreciated. Uh, it's important to uh, go into things wide, eyes wide open to really get a full picture of, of the choices we make as a society. Um, a question that came up about anaerobic digestion, the digestate that comes out um, at the end of the process, and whether you've looked at uh, uh, using digestate um, in soils. Um, in particular, uh, there's a movement for larger uh, industrial anaerobic digestion facilities to have installed depackagers, where basically you're taking clean material mixing with packaged food waste um, and it's just getting mixed together with whatever the packaging was. So that's a big question, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on any aspect of digestate. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of interest in uh, methane, uh, uh, biomethane production in, in the late 90s. Um, and we were involved with it quite a bit. Um, I went over to Europe and did some more work because um, methane digestion is very common now in Europe, and it, it's it's so common in Germany that uh, methane production and electrification based on burning methane now has had a substantial impact on reducing the need to import either Russian natural gas or uh, nuclear power. In this country, it still continues to be a very very small contribution, but it is growing and. Food scraps are, are an amazing source of methane production if you blend them with other waste, particularly manure. Um, so the digestion that comes out of it, it, it's almost like fresh waste that has not been composted, but it has significantly less um, uh, odor production in the long term, even though it smells anaerobic when it comes out of the digester, all those fatty acids have already been decomposed that I talked about. So um, we find that like food waste digestion is much better soil amendment than the raw material could ever be. And even it's even better than raw manure, even though there's an odor to it, it dissipates rapidly. So there could be a lot more work in that area, but um, Whoever asked the question may be involved in the industry, and that would be very interesting for me to interact more with them. Okay, good to good to know. Um, and yeah, I guess there was another question about where, what are the potential sources of microplastics and compost? And I guess this would be an example where, uh, if you were to make um, compost from the digestate that had packaged food waste that had been just basically ground up with the packaging, that is a potential source of microplastics. I don't know if you have any other, another comment or anything to add about microplastics and compost. Well, it's in the news a lot. Um, uh, there's, there's a group um, in Vermont led by Tom Gilbert that's been looking at this. Um, it's extremely important that composting not be a contributor of microplastics in the environment. And um, it takes a lot to make a microplastic. I mean, some kinds of plastic, um, I'd say the best ones, and it sounds ironic, the best ones don't break down at all and don't fragment into small pieces and can be recovered by screening. Um, but there are forms of plastic that are more fragile and fragment more easily and will break down very quickly. And the greatest irony of all is the so-called biodegradable plastics form large amounts of microplastics because they start breaking down and disintegrating. And it's created um, quite a, almost a backlash, particularly in Europe, to biodegradable plastics because it would be better just to remove the whole thing from the system than have all these little fragments still present in soil. So we're working with several groups like this to try to see what we can do to speed up the biodegradation, 
and we have to redesign our plastic molecules so that they don't need this high heat industrial composting to break them down. They have to be able to break down in natural environments. So this is a new cutting edge now of, of R&D, and we're seeing a shift in the chemistry of plastic towards understanding this better. Um, but uh, microplastics are, are unfortunately here to stay. And I think that the more reports we hear of uh, microplastics in water, studies have shown our bodies now have microplastics floating around in there. Um, eventually, it's going to boil over, I think. Yes, sobering yet, uh, like you said, a field where uh, we need some more bright minds thinking about it, um, thinking more holistically about our um, manufacturing system as a whole. Um, somebody asked about um, compost extracts and aerated teas, and if you have an opinion on that. It's often touted as a great way to inoculate your soil, but as you were just discussing in your presentation, that's not exactly what compost does. Um, exactly. And that, that's a really great question because <clears throat> what so the, the original field of compost teas, what we call compost teas here, originated in Germany um, at, at the university in Bonn um, by a, a scientist named Dr. Veltzian, who started studying the antimicrobial properties of watery extracts. And it's still called watery extracts in in Europe. And so he probably saw this work like in the 80s, and I discovered it in the early 90s. And I had a partner in our firm who was from the University of Bonn. And what's so unique about it is when you apply microbes extracted from compost to the plant surface, they actually have a significant impact. It's called the plant phylosphere. If you look at a plant leaf surface under a microscope, it's actually coated with microbes that are living there and have created a niche environment. And those microbes are actually protecting your plant from pathogens. So you can apply compost-based uh, microbes. I would say any, almost any soil-based microbe. You can make a soil watery extract. It would have a similar effect. And if it sticks to the leaf, and most of it doesn't stick, that's one of the problems, um, it can fend off disease. So the field of compost teas was developed as a potential movement to create natural microbial antiphytopathogens. And there were a few early attempts and successful attempts to um, have patents on compost extracts in Europe. Um, most of those companies have since failed because they can't compete with the chemical fungicide industry that can deliver a promised response. If you make an extract, it may not work. And the, mi the, the microbiologists that study it said the whole thing is just too darn complex. Um, different ways have different microbial consortia. Um, we don't even know which microbes had the antipathogenic effect. That and again, nobody's putting any money into it because you can't patent it. So a wonderful field of science is just kind of hanging in limbo right now because we really don't know what's going on. But there are some wonderful and dramatic studies that have been published in Europe. And I have at least four doctoral theses sitting on my shelf here from Germany, which attest to the fact that microbial extracts from mature compost um, can have a powerful anti-pathogenic effect on plants, such as scab on uh, on um, wine plants, um, leaf botrytis, um, apple scab. There's been some limited success. And for two years, um, there was a big story in Europe that we could control um, potato blight with compost extracts, and they were able to only reproduce it two times, and then it stopped working. So nobody ever figured out why it worked, but it, it's a continuing field of interest. And um, I, I certainly, if you go back to some early issues of BioCycle magazine, I have some papers on uh, the use and practice of preparing 
compost extracts and the use in vineyards and apple orchards. Super interesting. Um, and I just want to take a second to clarify that uh, the leachate from the composting process is very different than anything that we're talking about here in terms of using finished compost to make an extract with. Um, but there yeah. was a, go ahead. Leachate, unfortunately, has a really negative connotation in my mind. Um, that's the that's the drainage water coming off of a compost pile as it settles down, and it can be extremely foul-smelling and very very high BOD on that. Um, so definitely that leachate, if you have that leachate, that should be pumped and put right back onto the top of the compost pile until it's all decomposed. Uh, when we talk about compost extracts, we're talking about deliberately taking good quality compost, putting it in a liquid solution of water and cycling it in some fashion to create a, a um, microbially enriched uh, brew as it were. And BOD is biological. biological oxygen demand. And if that got into the waterway, for example, you'd be killing fish um, and so on because of the demand for air. And is there any benefit to taking uh, leachate? We also sometimes refer to it as contact water to try to separate it from just, you know, landfill leachate. Um, but the, um, is there any benefit to adding runoff from your compost pile back into a previous or, you know, uh, a new pile? Well, I would try to run it right into the pile that it was coming from because it's coming from the pile because it, it the water holding capacity has been exceeded and the percolation now has taken over. And, it's really difficult with composting because it's losing so much carbon every day. It's losing its water holding capacity by the minute. And so if it doesn't get rid of moisture by evaporation, you're going to see it as leachate. And um, practicing composting here in the Northeast, as I did for years, water and rainfall late in the year was just the curse of all composters because once the piles cooled down, you can't get rid of that water. And that's why there was this movement with all these compost fabrics that were introduced into America from Austria. It was a very innovative thing to start covering piles with a fabric like geotextile. It could actually breathe um, so air could go in and out, but it would shed the water. Yes, those are very handy uh, indeed in helping to control uh, the amount of water in your compost piles. Um, Next question um, has to do with whether you've studied uh, which types of soluble salts drive the salinity impacted results that you mentioned. Uh, the person who asked the question said they've read that not all types of soluble salts are bad per se um, that have a negative impact on crop growth. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, well, that's, that's very obvious. Um, I mean, it, when, when we most people think of salt as table salt, sodium chloride, and the plants have neither a great need for sodium nor for chloride, um, but they tolerate a certain amount of it. Um, and as you move out from sodium and chloride, you, there's a whole c a c group of, of soluble salts that you could call nutritional, uh, sulfate being one of them and nitrate being the other. But all of those contribute very heavily to a salinity index. And the problem with saying some of them are good salts, the salt, the salinity impact itself has a very negative effect on plant roots and, and creating reverse osmosis. It doesn't matter what it is. So a good salt can still be a bad salt. And um, the, good, the good news is the plants will see the nitrate. It may be damaging the plant, but the plant will start absorbing it and dropping the concentration. Whereas with sodium and chloride, it, it, it will tend to have a harsher effect because it doesn't have such a demand for it. So yeah, um, not all salts are created equal, but once, you, once it's an index of salinity, 
you have the potential to damage plants when it gets too high. Thank you for that. Um, I know in the composting industry more broadly and also um, in our mid-Atlantic area, there's been some discussion about the tests being used to um, assess the amount of phosphorus in a compost sample to try to predict how it will potentially contribute to water, water quality issues on a farm. Um, you know, in Maryland in particular, there's a uh, legacy phosphorus issues. So some farms uh, have to be very careful. Sometimes they can't apply compost because their um, phosphorus levels are already too high. Um, I'm wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on whether a water soluble or extractable, extractable phosphorus test uh, could be a good test for assessing phosphorus levels and organic uh, amendments like compost or is it really better to just go with total P, total phosphorus? It, it's, it's very difficult because there is organic forms of phosphorus in compost um, that, uh, you know, obey their own rules, but they become, it becomes available as the, or carbon, I keep emphasizing carbon is breaking down, it's releasing everything that was attached to it. So, you might have organic phosphorus one day and tomorrow the microbes have decomposed the organic component of the molecule. Where does the phosphorus go? It's going to be released, but in compost, it'll form all these associations with iron, mostly iron and calcium, of which there are plenty in most compost. So it'll form uh, versions of apatite. It'll form um, fairly insoluble iron phosphate. And then it's a battle of all the pH forces, uh, which one gets released first. Um, there are, so there are many mechanisms in compost that slow down the, the release of, of phosphorus. I, I, think, um, I think, you know, judgmentally, just trying to develop a test for water-soluble phosphate wouldn't contribute much to the discussion. Um, although I understand some of the reasoning for that is not to continue to treat compost phosphorus as, as on a pound for pound basis as, as uh, evil as superphosphate phosphorus on a pound for pound basis. And there's some need to do that because, you know, this country has used too much phosphorus historically in the last 50 years. And it's because we're obsessed with fixation in soil and we think fixation is just making it all uh, unavailable, but that's not true. As the background phosphorus builds up in soil from fixation over perennial excessive use of phosphorus fertilizers, you now have it dumping, equilibrating higher and higher levels of water soluble phosphate into the water pool. So, and it's just chemical equilibria theory that shows that. Um, if you do total phosphorus tests on soils, uh, again, farmed chemically without any manure phosphorus sources. We have farms now at two to three thousand pounds an acre of total phosphorus. They, they've accumulated that because they've been perennially using too much. The soil testing labs didn't take that into account, and it's leaking out of the system now. So I'm not sure how we'll ever capture it. Um, certainly, we have to reduce our phosphorus levels and. It is unfortunate that uh, there's so much manure implication, for example, in the Chesapeake Bay region. There, there's a, quite a bit of phosphorus cycling manure, very high loads of phosphorus. Um, in chickens, they need to design a chicken that doesn't need so much dicalcium phosphate supplementation. That would be a big help be, because they're not naturally a, a, a high phosphorus type of manure, but it's in the feed and, and it's it's coming back to us in this bad way. So that's a lot on phosphorus, I realize, but it is something of burning concern to so many people. Yes, and just another example of us needing to have a bigger picture approach to dealing with a complex problem. Um, and perhaps you mentioned this in your presentation, I don't remember. Are there ways that um, your average farm could reduce the, yes, the I guess, depending on the feedstocks they're using, but reduce the amount of available phosphorus that they're producing through their composting process? 
Um, probably, probably not. Um, I mean, the problem is once you put phosphorus in soil, the overwhelming mineral background of soil gets involved in, in, in reducing the availability of it. And um, early mechanistic studies that were done at agronomy schools around America, you know, pegged fixation as a problem with yield. And, and I mentioned this already, and so we went on a phosphorus binge, but um, the fixation is not forever. And um, we could add minerals to compost. Um, in France, there's a movement where they always add minerals to compost in the late stages. And I think one of the ideas is to tie up some of the phosphorus, maybe forming calcium phosphate. Again, that will slowly release in the soil. It's not forever. Um, I've, I've used iron additions in compost, but only to tie up ammonia, but they will grab hold of the phosphorus too if, if you use it. And if you use gypsum, it's possible it, it could be implicated in grabbing some of the phosphorus so it's not as available. So there are some things here, and if, if the government in its wisdom would only fund some more research on some of these organic dimensions of the movement of these minerals and molecules, we I think we could maybe have some new discoveries. Yes, that is a good thought to wrap things up with. Um, definitely, we need more uh, attention, more bright minds, more resources and uh, funding to look into so many of these uh, issues that you've helped us to clarify. Thank you so much for uh, the wonderful way you've really helped to simplify some complex issues for us, uh, Dr. Brinton, and for leaving so much time for question and answer. And um, thank you all for participating in, these, in this series. Thank you very much.